Hello everyone. Welcome to lecture three of Butterfly in the Quantum World. So the first lecture we talked about various different fractals and how they are related in mysterious ways. In the second lecture, we introduced this butterfly fractal, which is related to the Hofstadter set. And today we're going to dive deeper into various properties of this butterfly fractal and talk about how these integral Apollonian gaskets relate to the butterfly. And then we're going to also discuss different irrational numbers and talk about these quasi-periodic patterns found in the butterfly. So the first half of this talk is going to talk about this Apollonian butterfly connection. We're going to introduce this notion of integral Apollonian gaskets once again. We're going to also introduce this duality transformation. And in certain cases, we're going to find that an integral Apollonian gasket can be dual to another integral Apollonian gasket, but it can also be dual to what is going to be known as a forward Apollonian gasket. So we'll also introduce this concept. And since we discuss how the forward circles were related to the butterfly in the previous lecture. This will give you a hint towards how the integral Apollonian gaskets are related to the butterfly as well. So, as we previously mentioned, you can have Descartes' equation, which allows you to take three different kissing circles and find the curvature of the fourth kissing circle. We can take three circles with arbitrary curvatures and so we can choose three integers. So long as a solution exists to the equation where the fourth kissing circle also has an integral curvature, then what we'll find is known as an integral Apollonian gasket, where all of the successive smaller kissing circles all have integer values for their curvatures. So these are just a couple examples of these IAGs. And there's also this other change of variables that you can do between the curvatures k0, k1, k2, and k3, and you can talk about these variables l, k, m, n. They're related by this simple matrix transformation. So if we go into this basis, we can actually use this quadratic Diophantine equation to generate these IAGs. Sorry, a little typo there. So if we have integer values of l, m, k, and n, and it solves this equation, then we know we can transform these into curvature values associated with some integral Apollonian gasket. Okay, there's also this duality transformation that we can perform which involves multiplying some matrix D times the curvature values to find new curvature values. The duality transformation involves minus ones on the diagonal with positive ones on the off diagonals and then an overall factor of one half out front. So if we take three curvature values that are all approximately equal and we take the dual of those, what we're going to find is, in this case, another integral Apollonian gasket where we have circles that are touching at the same points as the other circles except they're a different size. So we have one ap integral Apollonian gasket in blue and then we have another one in red and these two are dual to each other and we see that the tangent points are located in the same spot but the 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 tangents to the circles on the two different gaskets are rotated by 90 degrees so here we see the tangent line for the blue circles is pointing up and down however the tangent line for the red is perp perpendicular to that and is horizontal so here's another example with, with an explicit integral Apollonian gasket generated by 2, 2, and 3, which gives 6. And we see that if we overlay this other one with 1, 4, 9, and 12, then we actually find that we get this similar pattern here if we overlay them over each other. We see that the 2 here touches, kisses the 3 at this location, precisely at the same point where this circle here, the 4, kisses this other circle associated with 1. So we have the same pattern again where they have the same tangent point here, but the tangent lines are perpendicular on these two dual integer Apollonian gaskets. Alright, so now that we've introduced 
this duality transformation, we want to point out that not all integral Apollonian gaskets are dual to another integral Apollonian gaskets. In some instances, you're going to find these forward Apollonian gaskets, which means that the outermost curvature value is zero. So if we have some gasket and we take its dual, we might find one of these. And if we think about what a zero curvature object would be, it's something with an infinite radius, a circle. So we might as well just think of it as a line. And that's what we see right here in red. So we could have some integral Apollonian gasket and it would, its dual would actually give us a circle that is so large that it's actually a line. And what this means is that we can have more than three tangent circles to this line now, as we saw with the, the forward circles. So we previously saw how the forward circles give us integer values and they relate to the rational numbers and we saw that we could generate an infinite number of rational numbers all kissing this x-axis. So now if we interpret that x-axis as a circle, it gives us this notion of the forward Apollonian gasket. And so if we combine the duality transformation with that change of basis previously discussed, we're going to find that the denominators of various aspects of the butterfly are more simply represented in terms of these other variables rather than the curvature. It just simplifies it a little bit. So finally, I just want to stress once again that the dual of an integral Apollonian gasket can either be a Ford Apollonian gasket shown on top here in red, or it could be an integral Apollonian gasket shown in blue here. But we're going to be most interested in the Ford Apollonian gaskets that are dual to integral Apollonian gaskets because the Ford circles connect to the butterfly. As we previously remember, the width of a butterfly at some butterfly C is related to the denominators of butterfly from the left and to the right of it. And we can also relate these Q values to another integral Apollonian gasket. So we know that these three values of Q squared are going to give us curvature values. And we can put that on a line where the line represents another object with infinite radius or zero curvature. So that is going to have some duality transformation and it's going to be dual to this integral Apollonian gasket, which is depicted in red right here. So we can see that this has a curvature of nine, which is three squared. And here I can square eight and find a circle with curvature 64. And here, if I square 5, I'm going to get 25. And then it just happens to be dual to this integral Apollonian gasket. This can be done for all of the butterflies, all of the different recursive butterflies in this fractal. So the largest butterfly, which goes from 0 to 1, has these two forward circles. And we see that it has, once again, some dual integral Apollonian gasket that describes aspects of this butterfly. So now we're going to talk about some symmetry, in particular this notion of trefoil symmetry. And as it turns out, we're not going to be able to find an integral Apollonian gasket that has exact trefoil symmetry, but what we can find is an approximate symmetry. So if we take three integers that are all extremely close to each other, we're going to find certain examples where the first, the fourth circle ends up being self-similar in a sense, where the symmetry is approximately preserved. So if we take this 32, 32, and 33 curvature values, we can find another circle with curvature 209. If we put that to the outside and put a minus sign there, since the, all of the integral Apollonian gaskets happen to have a minus sign for the outermost curvature, we'll find that there ends up being another integral Apollonian gasket that also has an approximate trefoil symmetry, except the symmetry is closer to being preserved because here we have 450, 450, and 451. 
And while the maximum distance difference between these two is one, just as was found here, since the numbers are larger, the relative difference is smaller. So once again, this pattern continues to infinity. We can go inside this and find this smaller circle and find another curvature value of 2,911, put that on the outside of another integral Apollonian gasket, and find once again even larger numbers that are very close to each other that have almost trefoil symmetry. As I was saying, to get the exact symmetry, we would need an irrational number. It wouldn't be an integral Apollonian gasket. We can see this by actually solving for Descartes' theorem. So if we take kappa 1 equals kappa 2 equals kappa 3 and call it kappa, this is going to be a perfect trefoil symmetry. It's going to be a threefold symmetry at least. And what we see is that if we solve for kappa plus and kappa minus, given these three values being all the same, we're going to find some irrational number. And we're going to get this 2 plus or minus the square root of 3. And in fact, if we take the ratio of kappa plus over kappa minus, we actually get what is known as the diamond ratio, 2 plus the square root of 3 squared. So this isn't an integral Apollonian gasket if we choose all of the kappas to be equal, but as we previously saw, there are IAGs that can converge to this trefoil symmetry. And you might remember from the first or the second lecture how we actually talked about the scaling, the flux scaling of the recursive butterflies. We had this generation L and we could increase L incrementally by an integer value. And in the limit of taking L to infinity, we found that there was this square root of two plus the square root of three that related to the curvature, the ratio of curvatures associated with widths of the butterfly. So this diamond ratio is related to this butterfly recursion in this way. And this makes more sense now because we previously related the forward circles to the widths of the butterfly. So we now related the forward circles to being dual to integral Apollonian gaskets. And then we saw how there are these examples of integral Apollonian gaskets that have this approximate symmetry that as we iterate, it gets closer and closer to the true symmetry and leads to this irrational value which is exactly the same value found here. So there, there's a correspondence here. Okay, so now that we've introduced this diamond mean, this diamond ratio, we're gonna talk about three different irrational numbers and how they relate to the butterfly. And they're gonna help us further understand different self-similar properties of the butterfly. There are these different hierarchies and these hierarchies are governed by different irrational numbers. And this is going to relate to this notion of Hofstadter recursion, and it relates to this interchange function between the golden ratio and the square root of 2 that I previously mentioned as well. So consider the golden mean, which is phi equals 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2. And then there's also this silver mean, which is 1 plus the square root of 2. And finally, this diamond mean that we introduce, 2 plus the square root of 3. They're all examples of these numbers where if you take this conjugate, where you take a plus the square root of b and multiply it by a minus the square root of b, and you take its magnitude, they're equal to 1. All of these irrational numbers, any irrational number, can be represented by a continued fraction. So we can take a series of integers and place them in this form. And if we go to an infinite number of fractions, then we will have something that converges to an irrational number. And then we can truncate to a finite number to get a rational approximation of the irrational number. So for example, we know that the Fibonacci sequence ends up leading to the golden ratio. And this is actually related to a very simple continued fraction 
representation that only involves ones. So the, gold, the golden ratio is actually one of the, it's the most irrational number in the sense that it converges slow, so slow because all of these numbers in the continued fraction are equal to one, which means that it's not changing too much on each iteration. If you had a larger number, it would have a more drastic effect. So in order to get a good approximation to phi, we're gonna to need to expand and keep more and more terms in comparison to other irrational numbers. I also just wanted to briefly mention that the golden mean is a solution to this quadratic equation. So there is another notion of taking the even Fibonacci numbers, and this follows a different recursion relation. It ends up relating to 2 plus the square root of 5, which is somewhat similar to a golden ratio, but it's a little curious because we get this four, and I don't know if you remember previously, but we saw this recurrence relationship before that involved fours. So this is actually the fourth metallic mean, and it's a solution to this quadratic equation. Okay, so now let's dive into the silver mean. Rather than having a Fibonacci sequence, it's described by a Pell sequence. It's given by this recursion relation, which has a two instead of a one, which, is, which would be there for the, the golden ratio. So the silver mean is a solution to this differential equation, and it has this continued fraction representation in terms of all of these twos. And also I wanted to just briefly point out that the octodon, octagon relates to this silver number as well because you see it in various different lengths of the octagon and it comes out in the area as well whereas the pentagon relates more to the, the golden ratio. Finally, the diamond mean is given by a similar recursion relation to that fourth metallic mean here, except we place a minus sign instead of a plus sign here to get a slightly different recur recursion relation. And we see that the, the continued fraction approximation of it first has a three here, but I could look at one plus the square root of three and then get a two here. What's really important are the later numbers. Here, we're gonna notice that there's going to be a periodic oscillation of orbit two between one and two, one, two, one, two. And I wanna point out that the golden mean had all ones, the silver mean had all twos, and this diamond mean is mixing ones and twos. So if that's not a clue, we're gonna try to relate these to the butterfly and see how it all comes together. And once again, the diamond mean actually relates to this, what appears to be a dodecagon, a 12-sided object here. And it's kind of curious that quasi-crystals in general tend to have five-fold, eight-fold, and 12-fold symmetry and the area of this dodecagon is related to this diamond mean here. So it's kind of interesting to see how these irrational numbers seem to be relating to symmetries associated with quasicrystals. Okay, so this is a recap of the various different recursion relations associated to various parameters found in the butterfly. So if we have rational flux values, phi, we could have some central phi at some level, which is one of the fractals, and we could look to the right and the left of that and fi find other butterflies. And these three different phi, c, r, and l's will have a p and a q associated with them, which is given by this fairy addition, and it relates to the, the Ford circles because the Ford circles are very similar to the fairy tree. And all of these integers, the P's and the Q's satisfy this simple recursion relationship and it led to this diamond mean. Okay, so we have these three hierarchies that we're gonna get into and we see that the diamond means recursion relations are identical to the butterfly hierarchies for numerators and denominators. 
And what this shows is that there is an irrational number with a periodic continued fraction associated to this fractal. It was oscillating between the two and the one. So we want to think about this diamond mean as sort of oscillating between the golden and the silver means via their continued fractions. And if you remembered, Hofstadter had this int function that related these 111 sequences to these 222s. Two, two, so it's kind of remarkable that it ended up working out that the butterfly is most naturally described by something in between these two. So this was quite influential to Hofstadter and really helped him out. So next we're going to dive into these hierarchies in a little more detail. So the diamond hierarchy has the center of the elf generation that is friendly to both the left and right edges of the higher generation. Furthermore, the left or right of the elf generation is friendly to the left or right edge of the L plus one generation. And each of these different hierarchies is going to have a slightly different property. This first property is going to be maintained for all. So for the golden hierarchy, once again, we're going to have some center of the elf generation, and it's going to be a friendly number with both the left and right edges. But now something gets flipped. The left or right of the elf generation is friendly with the right or left edge of the L plus one generation. So the second property flips it with respect to the second property of the diamond hierarchy. And the silver arc hierarchy is perhaps the weakest in the sense that this first property remains, but neither the left nor the right of the elf generation are friendly with either the left or right of the L plus one generation. So we're gonna get these three different hierarchies and we're gonna understand how to go between them in the butterfly and go through these each one by one. All right, so as it turns out, we can think about these Ford circles and think about the fairy addition and apply different moves, left or right. And as it turns out, these continued fraction values are going to relate to the number of left and rights we're gonna take. So if we have a sequence of all ones, we're gonna oscillate between left, right, left, right, left, right. For this diamond mean, this diamond hierarchy, it has two, one, two, one, two, one. So we're gonna see this oscillation of left, right, left, left, right, left, left, right, left, left. So we see this pattern Actually, you can see it as left, right, left, left, right, left, left, right, left, but you can also see it as containing this notion of right, left, left, right, left, left. So the right is a one and there's two left. So there's kind of this two, one, two, one oscillation happening. And finally for the silver, we have all twos and the characteristic character, let's call it, for this hierarchy is left, right, right, left. But if you look at the whole chain and you zoom out, you're gonna find these twos. You're gonna have right, right, left, left, right, right, and then it'll continue left, left, right, right. So if we follow the Ford circles and apply this pattern, we're gonna be able to find these numbers. So let's give it a shot. Let's start at one right here. So we're at this circle and we're gonna go left, right, left, right, left, right. We're gonna get something that is slightly larger than 0 0.6. And so if we continued this pattern of left, right, left, right, I'm just following the tangent circles here found in the, the Ford circles. So we find this convergent value that each circle would be centered on a rational value, but if we continue this pattern to infinity, we're gonna to converge to an irrational value. And we find here that something slightly larger than 0 0.6 ends up converging to 0 0.618 continuing approximately, which is exactly equal to minus one plus the square root of five over two, which is actually one over the golden ratio. 
And what we're going to find is most important is not the overall integer constant out front, but rather the irrational piece. So this is a part of the golden hierarchy because the golden ratio involves the square root of 5. And we see that we can use this sequence to converge onto an irrational number involving the square root of 5. All right, so let's think about this diamond hierarchy starting from this circle over here at phi equals 1 again. If we apply this pattern of left, right, left, and repeat that, we'll get left, right, left, then we'll go left, right, left, left, right, left. I guess we're going to get something that's slightly below 0 0.6, and it would be some irrational number. And as it turns out, the square root of 3 divided by 3 is precisely 0 0.5774. Well, not precisely, approximately this decimal value. But if we applied this pattern to infinity, we would get precisely this irrational number. So this is an example of a diamond hierarchy. Finally, we can apply a silver hierarchy. We can explore the silver hierarchy by looking at this pattern of left, right, right, left. And we're going to start from the same place again. So if I start here, I go left, right, right, left. And then I would go left, right, right, left. It's going to be somewhere in here. And it looks like it's going to converge to something maybe slightly above 0 0.7. And once again, we can find that there is this irrational number associated with something approximately close to 0 0.7. The square root of 2 divided by 2 is 0 0.7071, approximately. So we can see that we can actually start at any point in the butterfly and follow these patterns and go into what are known as these different hierarchies. So this is just going through some other examples. We can look at a golden hierarchy starting at somewhere else, and they, they start here, I believe, at 1 half now instead of 1. And they go left, right, left, right. I actually remember there being a typo in at least one of these pictures. I just took this from the book. But point out that you can truncate different irrational numbers. So for example, OK, if we look at the green, oh, I see. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. If we truncate it right there, we're going to end up giving us some rational number that is close to the some number related to the golden ratio, but not exactly. So we could have this 233 divided by 610, which is approximately this decimal. And note that 3 minus the square root of 5 divided by 2 is approximately this, and these two numbers are very close to each other. And we can follow the same pattern starting from 1 half with one of these other hierarchies. So if we follow this red diamond hierarchy, we go left, right, left, left, right, left, left, right, left. And we would end up, if we truncate it there, we would end up having 41 divided by 112, which is approximately this. And just note that minus 1 plus the square root of 3 divided by 2 is approximately this. And it's very close to the rational number found here. Finally. I could start with 1 half and follow this silver hierarchy once again. Left, right, right, left, left, see here's, this should be an R right here. Left, right, right, left, left, right, right, left. These, this left and right should just be flipped. There's not actually a mistake in this rational number. They just labeled it wrong right there. So we end up finding 169 divided by 408 which gives us 0 0.414 approximately. And remember that minus 1 plus the square root of 2 is approximately 0 0.414. So we previously showed how we can start from 1 and follow these three different hierarchies, or we could start at 1 half and follow these hierarchies. We can start at any butterfly we want and follow these hierarchies and find different irrational numbers that are associated with these different hierarchies. Notice that this 3 minus the square root of 5 over 2 is different than this number here, but they both have a square root of 5. So essentially any number that involves the square root of 5 and other rational numbers that 
other integers that is in this interval between 0 and 1, we could expect to find in this golden hierarchy. And once again, this is just going through other examples. So you can look at these different regions, and there's going to be this self-similar structure that can be found all over the place. I'm not going to go through another example because I just, I just showed you guys two different examples. So hopefully you get the idea. You have these three hierarchies. You can apply these moves left, right, left, right, left, or left, right, right, left, successively over and over and you're going to converge to some irrational number. Okay, and so finally, we just want to conclude by saying there seems to be some relationship between this and quasicrystals. Uh, here at Quantum Gravity Research, we are interested in this because we are interested in looking at quasicrystals and their applications to quantum gravity, so this was part of the reason why we are interested in some of this material. And we see that the gold and silver and diamond means are related to these fivefold, eightfold, and twelvefold objects, which is often associated to the symmetries with 2D quasicrystals, such as Penrose tilings. And we can see that this is happening because if we look at the cosine of 2 pi over q, this is some irrational number for when q is 5, 8, 10, or 12, and 10 is a 5 times 2. So we can sort of see how the irrationality just comes from this property alone, but unfortunately, the, connect, the full connection still is rather mysterious. So we would like to understand a bit more about how quasicrystals might be related to this butterfly, but all we are going to get for now is understanding how these irrational values associated to these symmetries relate to the butterfly via these different hierarchies. So I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.